Okay, so we um, are going to continue um, with this uh, study about governments. Uh, I didn't even think this is going to become uh, sort of a series. Uh, maybe we're done. But it's very interesting and very important because we talk about it quite a bit. People do talk about politics and how do you deal with uh, authorities, especially when authorities are out of line or when... Uh, uh, not just the authorities are out of line, but also when uh, uh, the people that are supposed to be submitted are out of line to authorities. And when I speak authorities, I hope it's clear by now that I'm not just talking about a government. There is different authorities and different powers that God ordained and instituted, and it is up to uh, uh, the, the man uh, to consider whether this is truly a uh, word of God and wise or not. And if it, if it is, then a man would be better off uh, just following the lead of the Lord and, uh, and, and truly uh, submit uh, to the authorities that are given. <clears throat> so what do we talk about? Latest sermons. We, one sermon was called Government, the Minister of God, right? It was a question. So is... Uh, is that really true? Because remember, some people really have a problem with that. You know, they always pick up on Romans 13 and basically blame Christianity or other religions just propping up illegitimate powers. Well, no, uh, the, the Bible is the Word of God. We believe it's correct. We don't uh, dispute that. We are seeking, in fact, to understand it and apply it to our life in order to live in liberty. And the people that promote the idea of anarchism essentially promote slavery. In the end, that's what it's going to lead to. It leads to bondage and leads to oppression, not liberty. Uh, we also talk about that Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that has uh, serious implications. We also talk about that God is on our side. And so if God gave us certain commandments to submit, He said that because He cares for us, not because He wanted to make our life more miserable, more than it is. Um, so that's the takeaway from it. We reject anarchism. We embrace authority that God ordained, and we love him for it. Okay, those are good things. Um, that doesn't, of course, mean that we applaud or somehow submit to uh, every decision that comes from uh, the authority. There are times where we just can't. We just uh, have to say no. Now, uh, last Sunday, we talked about... Uh, uh, the, the king being born, and we were discussing how Jesus is the king. And it's, a, it's obviously uh, a major, major historical event. Uh, it's not a... At the time when Jesus came, a lot of people just dismissed it. There's some Jesus out there, whatever. But of course, it was a groundbreaking event. Uh, he is uh, the future ruler of everything, and we also talk about in that connection with uh, the advent of uh, uh, second coming, which uh, is going to sort of finish the first uh, coming and uh, establish his heavenly kingdom. <clears throat> there are different authorities that God ordained. We talked about that. That would be one of the takeaways. And we discuss uh, how we are to uh, submit to higher powers. So different places, different situations, there is different powers, and there's always somebody at the top. So for example, uh, in, um, in, in the case of your body and yourself, you are uh, the person that's at the top or some kind of authority. In some cases, it will be a parent, obviously, when the child is small. Uh, in case of uh, church, you know, you have pastors, elders, and that sort of thing. In the case of family, you have uh, parents. In the case of marriage, you have a husband. <clears throat> in case of a country, you have a king. I mean, there is certain authorities, but even within... The government that we have, you know, we have certain jurisdictions. Uh, the government only can do so much. You know, I mean, the executive branch, right? It can only do so much. Uh, then you have the legislate, legislative uh, branch, and they can only do so much. Then also you have judicial branch. They can also do only so much. And they have certain jurisdiction, and that's where they are supposed to rule. So we reject rebellion. And there is plenty of rebellion in this world. Um, and rebellion, by the way, is what is promoted by an anarchist. Essentially, rebellion. And remember, I talked to you about the word rebel. I don't see anything good about it. Um, 
And so any, any kind of breach to rebellion has to be resisted uh, and, uh, and, de- and dealt with. Now today I titled this sermon, uh, Vice as Serpents and Harmless as Doves. That's from uh, that passage that uh, we read at the beginning, uh, from Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. The Bible speaks about that we are sent as sheep amongst the wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And I don't know if you ever thought about this statement and how does it apply? What does it mean? And I think it will be, I think it will be encouraging, all right? Because there is a certain um, uh, mindset that sometimes people have when it comes to the scripture, which is very defeated. And I, it's not. It's, it's it's the opposite actually. All right. So it's supposed to boost uh, boost us up. So. The takeaways that we will have to today from when we are done will be two, um, deciding about what f- battle to fight and how. And second, um, we will discuss how what we just talked about in terms of rejection of anarchism and how to apply uh, God's wisdom into these different authorities and, uh, and so on, how to apply it, because uh, it's, it's a little bit less... Uh, uh, comp- it's not as easy as it may sound at the, at the beginning, at, the, at first. So, <clears throat> first of all, I'm going to have about seven uh, principles throughout the sermons. But there's probably more, but you know, I boil it down to about seven principles. Hopefully, they will help us to guide us how to deal with uh, uh, the issues of authorities, government, and so on. But first of all, before we go any farther it is important that we remember principle number one. And that is that our kingdom is not of this world. So whatever we discuss, this has to be sort of a foundation that really, in the end, everything that we talked about is really temporary. All right? And it's re- it doesn't really matter in the long term. All right? Now, we, we read it last Sunday. Uh, th- th- Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, when Pilate asked him, right? And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, aware of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. And also, uh, let me remind you the story with Peter. Peter uh, confessed, when Jesus asked, what do people say that I am? Peter Peter properly confessed that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one. He's the Christ. Remember? And uh, the Lord told him, this didn't come from yourself. This was revealed to you from above. But then later on, um, as Jesus, uh, once they confessed this, and he started talking more about his sufferings and about uh, the prize and and really about the great mission. Uh, There is different things in the ministry of Jesus that that people liked, uh, feeding the people, uh, healing uh, the sick, all sorts of miracles. Um, people love that, but people did not like the negative message. Well, some people obviously didn't like the criticism, but that's not even what I mean. The negative message is that Jesus was pro- uh, prophesying that he is going to suffer and uh, die at the end of, uh, of uh, uh, the lost. And people didn't like to hear it, including Peter. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. This is in Matthew 16, uh, verse 22. And he says, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Just could not bear the idea. So we've got to stop this idea. This is not going to happen. But he turned and said unto Peter. So Jesus answers to Peter and he tells him, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. So here is a dilemma. Here is a suffering. Here is a... I would say here is attention to the things that be of man, this world, this kingdom. And Jesus rebukes Peter and says, that's not what this is all about. You seek the things of this world, but I am concerned about things that are not of this world. It's a matter of uh, the kingdom of heaven, we know that. And so consistently... In these two statements, we can certainly see it, and in many others, that Jesus did not care about his world. And it's something very easily forgotten. And we better be reminded what really matters, why we are here. 
And uh, what really is, uh, including when we are dealing with the issue of governments and so on, we are to remember this. Um, so here's the thing. This is our hope. We know what Jesus came for. This is what, if we are right, and if we are careful about this, and if we uh, resist the temptation to be concerned about this world, then this will be our hope that will guide us through difficult times. But think about it, what the lost person has. And we have a lot of friends and people that are almost like-minded, like us, but they're lost, right? Now think about it, what hope they have. So they don't have the hope that we do, right? They don't have that hope. They don't understand, uh, uh, they didn't look behind what's, uh, what's past this life. Uh, their hope is in this life, right? That's their hope. So think about it. Um, there is a lot of, about, among, look, there is a lot of people that will always compromise just to get by, right? So they don't care about the values. You know, you have people that climb uh, the corporate ladder or somewhere they want to promote, and they're willing to compromise anything. So they're, they're not about the values. But there is always people that do not compromise. They love liberty. They like, let's say, traditional values. They may even like certain Christian values. Um, they uh, love uh, the liberties that we have in uh, this country. They love a lot of good things. They love the country living. They like family. They like the old uh, uh, customs that they, that they have uh, inherited from their uh, predecessors and so on. So <clears throat> these people, they, they really, I, I don't think it must be easy to be in their skin. Because think about it, you clearly see it being eroded, all these values that they stand for. And that is the hope that they live for. So what do you expect uh, people like that would do? Of course, they're going to fight, right? They're going to try to fight for it. Now, some people are in this camp just because they have no other option. You know, there's a lot of people that are sort of on the, on the negative end of all this, uh, all this deal. Uh, they're not really uh, getting anything out of this. They're only losing. You know, like a poor people. If you have somebody living in a small town and uh, the only main employer is a coal mine, but because of the globalism, uh, the government decided they're going to shut down coal mines, then these people naturally will probably gravitate towards uh, maybe conservatism because conservatives will, let's say, promise that we should reopen the mine, right? So you have all sorts of motivations why people stand for this or that. And um, I also noticed that a lot of people among uh, these individuals that don't have hope in the heavenly kingdom, and yet uh, they stand for certain values that we stand also, you know, they may be for a lot of good things. Uh, and they may, be, they may be fairly brave and, uh, and uh, have a certain kind of integrity and character that uh, may be even uh, shaming us, you know, how strong they can stand. And what do they stand against? You know, they may stand against communism and socialism and against uh, uh, globalism, against uh, erosion of uh, the values in the West. Um, and you know what, we, don't we sympathize with them, right? But here's the thing, we are not on the same boat. We're, we don't share the same, we are not fighting for the same cause. We like them in some ways, but we are not on the same, in the same territory, right? Um, we have to remember that our kingdom is not of this world. And what happens sometimes is that Christians, because the values are so close to our values, that we sometimes drift away from the biblical Christianity, focus on what really matters in the long term, which is the kingdom of heaven, and we get entangled and really ramped up about the things of this world. So no wonder a lot of, a lot of Christians would be really obviously pro-Trump uh, in the States and so on. And... Um, and it, it can carry you away very, very far. Now, John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, and this is what it's about. Uh, we have to remember that this world is temporary, and this is where we find that famous scripture by Apostle John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And notice this, verse 17, and the Lord, excuse me, and the world passeth away. So everything, this is still principle number one. And that is, don't get too attached to this world and learn to let it go. So it's very tempting, I testify to it myself, it's very tempting to, to start to be concerned and to be too much varied and so on. Well, don't be. All right? It's not our home. This place is not our home. So that's the principle number one. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Right? We are not concerned and hopeful, much hopeful about this world. So that's a principle number one. That's what we have to build on. Now, second uh, issue, uh, I want to talk about an interesting phenomenon that we discover in, in the new heaven and, and uh, new earth that the Bible describes. Notice this. Interestingly enough, the authority structure that we can detect as Bible shows it to us, is very different in heaven than in this world. And in this world, we have, like we said, we have governments, and there is a husband and, uh, and uh, parents, and, um, and uh, you have churches, and, and you have all sorts of uh, authorities, but we don't see that in heaven. All these authorities are discarded. Think about it. I don't know if you ever really consider that. But uh, in new heaven and new earth, there is no, for example, there is no husband. There's no, uh, no marriages in heaven, right? You know, except one marriage, and that's a lamp of, and, and his church, right? Lamb of God and the church. So that's the only marriage. But there's no marriages, so there's no, the, the, the dynamic is very different. What else is not there? There's no fathers, there's no parents, and there is no children. So, you know, the, the, the commandment number, what is it, uh, Five, you know, honor your father and mother. You know, it's not really in heaven. There's no parents. Now, there's, of course, a God, the father, and we, the spiritual children. But uh, among the people, we are sort of equals. Um, there is no priest. It's another authority that was in the Old Testament, right? There was the authority of the king, but there was the authority of the priest. And that was not mixed. That was a certain authority. He was able to do certain things. He came to God. He, uh, he was praying on behalf of the people. He sacrificed. He did certain things. He had certain jurisdiction, which was uh, Levitical priesthood and so on. That's not in heaven. Baba says, and I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. All right? Gone. Another authority that's not in there. It's kind of... Uh, Interesting. The Bible says that there is no sun and moon in heaven. Now, we may not think about it, but sun and moon are certain authorities. It's kind of strange, right? But the Bible gives us sun and moon to rule the day and to rule the night. And we may not really, we are so used to it that we don't really realize it, but it really dictates your life big way, right? You know, it really dictates your life. Sun goes down and you've there is no negotiation. In the winter, sun is really low and it doesn't shine much of a day, so we get cold. Do you negotiate with the sun? Are you going to rebel against the sun and walk outside in swimming suit anyway? No, you're going to obey and you're going to, you know, dress up. At night, you're going to put a light on. We are ruled by the sun and the moon. Well, the Bible says, and the city had no need of the sun. Neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the lamb is the light thereof. Revelation twenty two five, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So no no light there, no sun and moon. There's no, of course, governments. There's no rule of uh, kings and all sorts of lords and rich people. All these things are gone. So notice, all authorities exist there to rule, right? That's the point of an authority, is to rule, right? Is to uh, set rules and uh, enforce the rules and make sure that things are done orderly. So they are to rule. 
For what purpose? Often it's all about curtailing evil. That's why authorities are there. The purpose of authority is to make sure that we don't destroy destroy ourselves. That's why there's authorities. That's how it is in this world. That's why it is uh, in the family. That's why it is everywhere. That's the purpose of the authority. So notice, the ruling is actually profitable. And uh, if it is done right, if it's, if it's done properly, I realize that sometimes authorities, they become the tool of the evil. Right? And then that becomes a problem. Uh, you have places where, you know, it would be the police that actually harms the, the people. And they're there to protect and to uh, enforce a law and order. But sometimes they become the perpetrator of evils. You know, do you think that happens at home? Do you think there's fathers out there? God ordained fatherhood, right? But do you think there's fathers out there that actually abuse their children? Right? I mean, it happens. But that doesn't mean that necessarily the structure, that the principle of authority is wrong. Uh, but um, uh, it is, it's just corrupted. So why is the authority there? To curtail evil. And that's why I don't like this whole idea of anarchism. Because that would necessarily mean that there's nobody to enforce the, the, the law and, and uh, curtail the evil. So then it's going to go uh, bad, of course. So we say no to anarchism again. Um, but how is it in heaven? You know, do we need rulers in heaven? Of course we don't, because there's no evil there. So it's a, it's a makes sense that uh, the evil is uh, in new heaven and new earth is, is, is done away with. And so we don't have to uh, have all these different structures and authorities. The um, Bible says, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And by the way, you may notice that when it comes to these authorities, everything uh, shifts from authority that was earthly, to the authority of God and Lamb, whether it's a fatherhood, whether it's the marriage, you know, the husband is Jesus, father is God, uh, all these, uh, son, son, no more son, God is the son, right? Temple, no more temple, Jesus is the temple, right? So everything is shifted, and there's no more all these different authorities, there's only one authority, and there is God. Now, <clears throat> perhaps even more interesting, uh, is the fact that even Jesus himself is going to transfer his authority and power to God the Father. That's kind of interesting. I don't know if you ever thought about this in any major way. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we talk about resurrection, how we are resurrected, how Christ is risen from the dead, and so are we going to be. But then it says this, um, Then come at the end, this is verse 24, Then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. So God ordained Jesus to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is going to conquer the evil. But when he is done with all this, he's going to transfer all this power and give it to God. Uh, we'll continue to read. When he shall put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. <clears throat> and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he, that's God, has put all things under his feet. But notice this. But when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. Excuse me, accepted. And then now here, verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, to Jesus, when all things are subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. And that's why we see Jesus sitting on the right hand of God uh, in, in the throne of heaven. They occupy the same place, and he is the right hand of God, right? Uh, the Bible says that God may be all in all. So all authority is given to Christ, all authority that's in this world, and then all authority God, Jesus has and is given to God so that he is all in all. So this is the reality in new heaven and new earth. And I want us to understand it. This shows us that all these authorities that we are submitted to 
are there temporarily in this world. And while they are there, God says, just obey them. Uh, submit yourself unto these authorities. So remember, principle number one, uh, don't be too attached to this world. Let it go. And we just talked about the fact that these uh, authorities are temporary, all right, as well as, well as is the world. Now, here is, a, here is the issue. So it seems simple enough, right? We talk about we don't like anarchism. We should submit ourselves. But we also don't like when authority is in, infringing on somebody else's authorities. We don't like it. But it happens. And essentially this, is, uh, this uh, boils down to rebellion. Rebellion is all over the place. And it's not always rebellion of the, of the peasants against the kings. Sometimes it's the rebellion of the king against the peasants. Right? When the king basically uh, steps out of his authority and, and enslaves other people, now you're rebellious then, right? There is a certain uh, things uh, that uh, God ordained, and if somebody steps out, then it's a rebellion. So we have to understand, it seems simple enough, because once you understand that first of all, God put authority in place, and second, there are certain authorities that you are to uh, understand what they are. Now, once you have all this kind of clarify and settled, then it's simply enough. Just endorse it, right? Just, just live by it. Well, it's not that easy. It's not that easy because um, that's where the trouble often is. To submit rebellious spirit to the principle of God is very difficult. Very difficult. So, we know what the ideal is, right? We know what is right and wrong. But how do you make sure that it happens that way? Sometimes it's relatively easy. Maybe you have full power to, 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 to get it done. But sometimes you don't have that power. Sometimes you, are, you know what is right thing to do, but you are not allowed to, to get it done. And that is the true problem that we deal with. Right? That is the issue. So, for example, you know, when it comes to governments, right? You have governments going rogue. You have illegal directives and bylaws. You know, we talk about with regards to COVID. There's tons of things that are really questionable when it comes to government uh, coming with uh, certain uh, laws and bylaws and, and increase, you know, using it as, to increase their power, raise the taxes and, and get more and more um, uh, active in the lives of men. You know, you have, hey, think about these wicked laws, you know, like abortions, you know, uh, assisted suicide, sodomy, all sorts of anti-Christian bias. You have that issue going on when it comes to government. What else? You have subversive elements that are trying to change the government from within by bringing all sorts of uh, um, wicked ideas. You know, you have communists. You have these radical liberals, sometimes you have Muslims, they would like to, you know, do Sharia laws. It's all sorts of people that are trying to, to destroy it from within, right? Then you have enemies from outside. Sometimes just open armies, sometimes it's subtle, through spying and through all sorts of attacks. There is a rebellion on the government level, on the level of state, all over the place. All over the place. It's just being attacked from left and right, uh, top and bottom, all over the place. Now, what about the area of marriage and family? Do you think everything is kosher there? There is, of course, rebellion going on there all the time. It is constantly tested. There is a line in the sand, and it's constantly tested on both sides. Parents tested the parent, uh, the parents, uh, excuse me, children testing the boundary of the parents and being rebellious. We all know about it, but also some parents. You know, they don't always stand right. They don't always do the right thing. You guys uh, will probably agree with that. Uh, what about in a marriage? You know, uh, is there women that will not submit to their husbands? Plenty of them out there. What about the husbands that fail the women by not providing, not loving, not, uh, not being there for the woman? And we all are failures. Whether it's a women in submission, whether it's a man in, in their submission to the Lord or in their 
uh, leadership as a, as a leader, as a, as a caregiver, as a defender. Right? So it's all over the place. What about in the, in the churches, in the matter of faith? Well, what do we want? We want strong, well-educated, loving, uh, faithful pastor. Uh, we want a faithful word of God. Well, that, that, that's the ideal. We want that. But is that a struggle? Massive struggle. You have pastors that are not faithful to the word of God, or they misunderstand it, and so on. There is tons of breaches. Then you have a people that hate the pastor. They want to take him down, or they leave because they don't want to listen to death truth or this truth or whatever. There's all sorts of issues. We live in a very imperfect world. So notice, we talk about the ideal, right? The ideal, we know what it's, what it's supposed to be. But in reality, we find out it's not as easy. And that's my principle number two. It's simple enough, right? Just know what the authorities are supposed to be. Defend your right if somebody infringes on yours, right? And apply your authority where you're supposed to apply your authority. When it comes to your submission, submit to the authority. Simple, isn't it? Not so simple. Sometimes you are asked to, sim- to, to submit to somebody that's really difficult to submit to. Sometimes you may, you're maybe in a, in a position of authority. You're supposed to stand and maybe you're scared. Right? Or you're weak in some ways. And you fail others. That is the truth. That is the reality. And so I want us to remember, sometimes young people, they have the tendency to, to be ambitious and to say, okay, we're just going to change the world for better. I'm going to do it very different. Not so easy. And I want you to remember that, that we are flawed. We are flawed. We are not really able always to put everything in a perfect order. It's not so easy. There is plenty of examples of uh, failures and frustration in the Bible. Think about, I'll, I'll, sh- I'll show you a few. Think about it. <clears throat> for, for, for one, remember Elijah uh, deals with the nation that drifts away from uh, following God, clearly, right? And uh, so th- there's tons of prophets, uh, false prophets, Baal worshippers, propped up by Jezebel, uh, the queen from Tyre that married uh, Ahab. Ton- uh, terrible corruption, decline in a society, Elijah is the man of God, and how does he bring, wake up the people and say, this is all falsehood? How does he do that? Well, finally, he has an opportunity. He says, why don't you bring all your prophets, and let's sacrifice to God, and let's see, and I will pray to God the Father, and we'll see who, who you know, who is the God. And it was so great event, wasn't it? You know, God clearly did not, or this Baal did not respond to these uh, uh, wicked worshippers. But when Elijah prayed to God after they poured water on, 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 the, on the sacrifice, he received it. It just went into flame. And people could see with their eyes, suddenly wake up. It's like, whoa! Right? You know, this was a great victory <clears throat> because people lived in rebellion, in bondage, taking authority from the priest, from God, and gave it to Baal and some fools and false worshippers and, and prophets. And suddenly it was all exposed. It was a great day, right? But here's what happens. Once Jezebel found out, she started hunting for Elijah, right? She just could not stand it. And that was the last time people saw Elijah. And probably went to Baal worshipping again. She, she didn't kill him, but he escaped. And uh, the decline of their society continued. What a great moment. It's so depressing, right? When you're there and people finally see that maybe things will change finally. No, it's just temporary. It just goes back. So you see how it's difficult? How frustration and failure is with us in this world? How about God pleading with Cain? I find it interesting that God has to plead with Cain. Right? Right? It's not up to, you know, Jesus goes to Nazareth and he could not heal anybody because there was no faith. Pleading with people, right? It's so easy. Just submit to God and there will be miracles. But no, they would not submit. Um, Of course, we have plenty of God pleading with people. You know, 
follow me, I care for you, right? But people will follow uh, different things. Um, Apostle Paul pleading with Christian Jews and Jews in general, showing them to submit to this new uh, revelation to Jesus. Uh, and no, they would not submit to it. Of course, Jesus himself, you know, he couldn't get through many. A lot of people rejected him, hated him. Some people just didn't believe in him. You know, there is a lot of rebellion in this world. That's where we live. Now, there's also an example of successes. One was, for example, with Elijah, but it was short-lived. Um, you have a deliverance of Jewish people uh, from the hand of Haman. Remember that? Haman, um, uh, what did he do? I mean, it was a government out of control. You know, doing illegal things, just murdering some people. Uh, well, uh, God uh, gave them deliverance. Of course, it was uh, with God uh, being involved. Uh, how about people just receiving the gospel? That takes a submission to the word of God, right? Those, every time somebody gets saved, it's a miracle. It's a great day. It's a, it's a day when somebody uh, rejects the idea of rebellion and submit to God. That's why we talk repentance, because there is a repentance happening, right? It's a turning away uh, from your own ways to, to God's way. Um, there's uh, plenty of others. Um, how, about, um, how about Apostle Paul? We're talking about salvation. When Apostle Paul goes and tries to drag people to Jerusalem to be tried for their faith in Jesus, you know, he's stopped. He's a man out of control. He's a man in rebellion to God. Jesus tells him, why do you persecute me? And what are you doing against me? You can't go dead. And uh, what happens? God stops him and converts him. So now Paul is a different man. And he is, uh, it's, it's, it's a victorious day. It's a great day when, uh, when this happens. So notice, even though we know what is right, and we know what the right structure is supposed to be, we can paint the ideal picture, how to build a perfect kingdom. We are not able to do it because we are all flawed. And we are dealing with people that resist, uh, including ourselves, uh, the order of God. That's, 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 that's the reality. That's the reality that we deal with. Now, here's another thing that I want us to uh, keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> so whether we like it or not, there will always be breaches and rebellion in this world because that's the nature of this world. And uh, confusion about authorities that God put in place. And it's, uh, it's a bit like a jungle. And you can't really truly rest and expect that there is going to be somebody maybe make sure that uh, uh, the wonderful place that you have is going to be in place. You just never know. That's the true, unpleasant truth about this world, that you cannot really rely on somebody else uh, finding it for you. They may be there, but they might not be there. And so often people fall into illusion that someone, there's somebody else out there uh, taking care of things. You don't have to worry about. We don't have to worry about some enemies. We don't have to worry about decline of our society because there's institutions and people that are taking care of these things. Well, the tr <laughs> naked truth is that uh, these people are not reliable, and while it may have worked for a while, you know, it may fail, and you cannot really trust it. So, for example, you know, we have a system of uh, judges. And judges make sure that if there is any dispute, right, you just bring it to the judge and he's going to fix it. Yeah, but the problem is that judges are often corrupted and they have a certain agenda. They may be part of some lobby group. They may be paid off. They may misunderstand. Maybe they have an ideology in their head that goes against yours. How about police? I mean, it's great, but sometimes it's not great. How about uh, journalists? You know, journalists are there, supposed to kind of keep um, the fire under the, uh, under the feet of the politicians, you know, to keep them accountable. But uh, we, we can see what's happening. I mean, complete failure in this country, in U.S., same thing. Complete failure. They're not doing their job. Corrupted they are, they are right? What about governors and mayors? You know, it could be good, but often it's not good. And, uh, you know, presidents and MLAs, you know, often you would think they will stand for you. They will represent you. But they didn't represent you. 
You know, people think they, they vote for somebody, especially in the U.S., right? People vote for a president. Uh, you don't really vote for the president. You kind of validate it. But who really votes for the president is some, some very important people, some very powerful people that have a lot of money and influence, right? They really choose the president. But people have this illusion that, you know, they choose it. What about democracy, right? Hey, we don't have to worry about the problems in this world because we have a democracy. The worst things that happened in the world, including communism, came on the wave of democracy. It doesn't always work. How about pastors and teachers in the church? Yeah, we, we don't have to worry about these things because we have pastors that are going to tell us the right things. Often they fail and tell people lie. How about uh, scientists or academia and uh, schools and everything like that? Do you think uh, at least we have these people, they really know what, we, what they're talking about. They have an agenda. They fail you. They fail us. They may be good. They may not be good. How about businessmen, bankers, and uh, people that understand the markets and how things are working in this world, rich people? They will probably not be there for you, right? How about uh, the doctors? We can trust the doctors, right? Yeah, we can, we can trust the people that give us the vaccine, right? Surely they have no ulterior motives. Can we, can we trust them? I don't. I don't trust them. I don't trust doctors. I mean, I, I appreciate their opinion and their education, and I, I obviously trust some more than I do others, but I always verify. You know, it's like the auto mechanic. You know, you, you want to have a second opinion, and you don't just buy everything they tell you. How about military? Can you always trust military? You know, can you always trust... Uh, how about in the family? Can you always rely that your sibling or your spouse or your parents or will, will be there no matter what. You know, sometimes they fail you just because they are, they are weak. It's not maybe that they're bad. It's just they're weak. And uh, so, you know, what's the result of this? What's the conclusion of this? You cannot make, you cannot rely on people. Not, not to some ultimate degree. It's obviously we learn to be uh, they're one for another and be reliable. Um, we are trying to restore what God ordained. We want to have a family where husband <clears throat> is uh, doing a good job, where wife is doing a good job, according to the scripture. And the more you do it, the more blessing comes. Right? But we have to remember that in the end, you don't put trust in man. Jeremiah, right? I often quote the scripture, Jeremiah 5, uh, verse 5, uh, chapter 17, Thus say the Lord, cursed be the man that trusted in man. It really is true that whatever people trust, whether it's their governor, their doctor, or their military, or their president, if you trust in a man, the Bible says you're cursed. And this is the consequence. Um, the Bible says that a uh, uh, man that trusted in a man is a cursed man, he makes flesh his arm and whose heart departed from the Lord. People that put trust on people are people that are not faithful to God. That's what it says. And it says that he shall be like the heath in the desert. Not a pleasant environment. You know, heath is sort of marshland and some brushes. It's useless and not very fruitful. And he shall not see when good cometh. But he shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not be inhabited. That's the consequence for men that trust other men, that puts trust on people. So, um, from that, I have to say, and we have to conclude, that um, we are not to expect that someone will ensure our rights and liberties and, and uh, prosperity and safety. Don't trust man, any man. You know, they're, they're, of course, people. And so trusting in them is irresponsible and foolish. Now, the same passage in, in chapter, uh, chapter 70 of Jeremiah offers a proper alternative. And this is, we're coming to principle number three and four. And that is, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. And it's a little bit similar to what we were talking at the beginning. Our kingdom is not of this world. And this is now about our God. Our God is He in whom we put our trust. 
and not in a man. Now notice what happens. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. This is a great benefit. This is what we are concerned about, aren't we? About sustainability, that we are sustained, that we make it through, and that we are fruitful, that we do well. And God promised he will give it to those that trust him. And uh, like he promised that those that put their trust in a man, that they're going to suffer and they're going to struggle. So that's a principle. Number three is <clears throat> that people will fail you. Remember that. So whatever we talk about, you know, standing for the truth and for the ideal, do not trust man. Don't put your trust man. It's guaranteed that he will fail. And number two, number four, God will never let you down. God will never let you down. So those are principles uh, that we can build on. Now, of course, the question is this. <clears throat> Like I said, it's very natural, especially for young people, to be zealous and full of ideals and idealism. And we need to stand uh, for what is right. Like I said, it's not always easy. And you're probably not going to succeed in every area. All right. Uh, so, um, sure, it's good to strive for a better world, right? Especially in, within your sphere of influence. I mean, go for it, right? Please do it. Uh, as children, you can do it now. There's plenty of areas where you can stand for the right thing. As uh, parents, we ought to do our best to, uh, to, to apply the principle that we find in the scripture and live by it. As a husband, I got to work on it. My wife, as a wife, she, she works on it. There's so many areas where we ought to work on it. But just remember, it is not about this world. In the end, this is temporary. And so uh, don't waste too much energy on things that are to perish. Focus on the things that are uh, eternal. It's not that easy. <clears throat> remember that. When I say it's not that easy, and that was a principle number two, it's often, what I really want to say, it's often impossible. You know what is right, but you're not going to get your way. You know, think about, <clears throat> and, and, and uh, I don't want to necessarily discourage somebody. Sometimes uh, people accomplish uh, great things when everybody thought it's impossible. So I don't want to leave that taste behind. But uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, you may not always get your way, even though your way would be a great way. All right? <clears throat> So the question is now is this. Okay, so when we consider this, that we shouldn't be attached to this world, we realize it's not always easy and sometimes it's just about impossible. We realize that people will fail you and the only one you can count is God. Does that mean that we should even care or try to fight or stand for liberties and rights that, uh, let's say, we should have? There are sometimes even enshrined in the Constitution or Charter of Rights and that sort of thing, right? Should we really worry about these things since they are not necessarily spiritual in nature? Uh, that's a question, right? And you know that there's plenty of Christians, they say, no. You know, this is completely this world. We don't worry about these things. Well, I'm not of that view, and I don't believe the Bible says that. Uh, we do care uh, about our world we just don't love it and don't put it on, on the first spot. But we, of course, do uh, use the scripture, use the wisdom of God, and apply it in our life. Of course we do. Right? Now, does that apply to even, let's say, to political things? It's probably the number one thing that comes to people's mind, right? Liberties and rights when it comes to politics. Listen, in Romans, the chapter 13 that we read from, that deals with uh, anarchism, Render therefore to all their dues. The Bible says to render all to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything. You know what it tells me? It tells me that you ought to give to all their dues. You've got to participate, whatever capacity you are in, in this world, according to what is required. So I am, for example, I am in a position of, of a husband. So I, uh, I had to work out 
and be as best as been as I can be. I'm also a father, so I ought to work as a, as a father as much as I can be. Is there some other ways that I'm involved in this world except the, the, the church and, and, and this activity? Uh, am I involved in, uh, in uh, let's say, public affairs in some ways? And does that include that too? Well, um, how about, what, what, if, what if there is a community fire? What is this some kind of, uh, and there's no, there's no firefighters, you know, it's all uh, just a self-help. Uh, what, what do you do? Will you not go and help the community? Of course you will, right? Well, now you're involved in a community life. What if there is all sorts of other calamities, right? What if you, um, what if you see a robber robbing your neighbor's house? It's not your house. Will you not be concerned about him and will you not go and help? Of course you will. And that, you know what? That's really what public affairs is about. You know, there are certain things that strictly I worry about myself. You know, my car, my house. How do I get there? The clothing, financing, just, just my family. But we live in a society and in a world where we're depending on other people, even though they're not Christians. So isn't that right to care for other people since we share the road with them and the air and the community? Of course it is. Don't we enjoy the fact that we are protected by even the police force? That uh, we have um, military uh, protecting the country. So we ought to do our part and pay for it. And, and, and be involved in it. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And I believe that's what it says when he says, Render therefore to all their dues. There is a certain, it's not just just about me it's also about the community in which I'm part of so it makes completely uh, uh, co completely makes sense to be involved to some degree now do you have to run for the office maybe not I mean you, you choose your fight you know everybody has a different mission and I don't believe that this can be really dictated from a uh, from the pulpit um, one way or another we are all involved in a community life and if somebody goes ahead and actually uh, let's say, goes and votes for somebody, or maybe uses other means of political engagement, including, let's say, protesting, demonstration. That is actually a legal thing to do, right? You know, when, you, when, you, um, when somebody runs for office, when somebody goes in a debate and challenges, uh, let's say, in a position, from a position of maybe journalist, you know, you're going to have a conflict, but it's a good thing to do. And somebody may find... Um, a call in, in that area. I personally don't, because there's just so much uh, you can do, but, uh, but I, I would not uh, discourage if there was a Christian and would pick up the cause. Hey, there may be people that would pick up the cause of abortions and they want to go against it and they make a life, uh, they make it a life mission. I'd say let's support them, right? Let's support them. Now, remember though, Remember, though, that uh, if there is a person, you're going to have a Catholic people involved in uh, some kind of mission against abortions. Well, we may support their cause, but as a citizen, right? But we're not on the same team. We don't have the same God. So it's something that we have to always uh, be reminded of. All right? So, again, just because we put our hope in the world to come, that doesn't necessarily... Um, eliminate uh, our responsibility to be involved in our life, you know, in our marriage, in our family, in a church, and even in community. Whether it's the small community, let's say our neighborhood, the larger community, the county, the province, or even the country. You know, it's okay to be involved in that. Now, at some point, it may get completely out of control, then maybe sort of lost. So you don't, you kind of Put your energy where you can make some impact. I understand that people sometimes give up on certain political engagement because it feels like it makes no difference. I get that. And, I, and th then put your energy somewhere else then, right? So, um, <clears throat> again, remember not to be overly attached to this world. Whenever uh, people are, are supposed to be somehow involved in... Uh, any, any sort of activism, uh, just, just, just remember, it's not about this world. A lot of people that, that uh, get involved in the politics is because they love this world. 
Sometimes it's because they love the fame and the money that comes with it. And sometimes it's because they want to save the world. You know, make America great again, or whatever, right? I mean, that's what they are all about. Well, it's too far. And I realize people will say, I love my country. Okay, but careful with that, though, right? We are not supposed to love this world. Don't take it too far. Now, um, next principle, we're going to go to principle number five and then um, uh, six and seven. So I'm going to read you from Matthew again, uh, Matthew 16, 20. We read this, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as dove. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in the synagogues and so on. So what do we see here? He says, the Lord says that he sends us as sheep in the midst of wolves. All right. So think about it. Sheep are, sheep, sheep is a clean animal, first of all. It's considered clean. Wolf would be considered unclean, right? Like a dog. That's one thing. So also, he says, I send you forth as sheep. So, Christians are compared to sheep. And wolves, then, would be compared to the adversary and the lost people. So, that's another distinction. Another thing that we know about sheep is just, it's in some ways kind of uh, innocent and kind of uh, vulnerable and pure in some ways, Right? Where the, where the dog or she, or excuse me, wolf, you know, is aggressive and sometimes subtly, right? How do, how do dogs attack uh, their prey? Well, they surround it. They try to come from the back when they're vulnerable, right? Sheep don't do that. Sheep, it's just not there in the mentality. But the dogs do that. The, the, the wolves do that. And God says that he's, Jesus says he's sending us as sheep amidst the wolves. And then he also says, be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now think about that. Now what is a dove? It's actually a very similar example. Dove, like sheep, is considered a clean animal. This is something actually we are allowed to eat compared to, let's say, ostrich or eagle. You're not supposed to eat those uh, birds. But doves, pigeons, and so on, uh, chicken, right? You can eat those. It's considered a clean animal. It's also very vulnerable. We were just watching the, uh, the popelka, right? You know, so the, the doves came and helped there with it. You know, you can see that they, they, they will sit in you. They, they, they're, they're not danger compared to, let's say, eagle or some, some kind of uh, aggressive animal, right? So they're clean, they're vulnerable, they're pure. Often they're white, you know, or some kind of color like that. Now, on the other hand, serpents is a nasty animal, right? I mean, think about cobra or some big uh, uh, junk, uh, Amazon River type of um, a monster. You know, it's a disgusting animal and it's very subtle, right? It goes like this, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't go straight, right? And um, that's, uh, that's the idea. We get danger, uh, sneaky. Now, I don't know if, I don't know how about you, but I often have the feeling that sometimes Christians assume that when Jesus says, I sent you forth as a sheep in the midst of wolves, it's almost this defeated idea. I remember when we were watching about the Mennonites or Amish, remember there was one scene from some movie and he says, you know, you know, we're sent as sheep to the wolves. Who is with me? And it it, it gave the impression that uh, that's sort of uh, our fate. You know, we are sheep. And we're just, we need to accept our fate and we're just sent to the walls, right? Isn't that the feeling sometimes you get from people? Um, so I don't think that's what it means. It's, I don't think that Jesus says, just accept your fate. You know, now you're purified and you're going to be slower. I, think that, I don't think he's saying. Because with the same breath, he says, be therefore wise as serpents. And harmless as doves. So, what Jesus is saying is that, uh, of course, we are not serpents. We are the sheep, we are the doves. But we are advised. That's what I hear here. I don't know if you do to see, see the same thing. We are advised to sort of adopt some of the skills we see in the wolves, we see in the 
in the serpents. Is that what it says? It says, be ye therefore wise as serpents. Now what is the problem? Why is he saying that? Well, because Christians are often dumb, may I say it. And, and very, I, I think there's some naivete that comes often with Christianity. And people then go and, and allow the, the wolf to just eat them alive easily. But Jesus says, you know, be there for wives and serpents. And then in, he says, be aware of man. Be careful of man. Don't be just naive. Uh, in Luke chapter 16, verse 8, the Bible says, And the Lord commanded the unjust steward. Remember that's the parable that he gives about this steward that actually kind of cheated on his master to kind of get his way and prepare sort of uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his future in case he's going to be fired. And, uh, and Jesus commended him for that. He says, you know what? Uh, and then he says this, because he had done wisely. It's the same principle. He says, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. That's the same problem. That sometimes Christians, and you know, they're so, they're so pure, okay, to some degree, right? Uh, <clears throat> that they often become very naive, not very shrewd and not very prudent and not very wise. But Jesus said, you know, learn some wisdom, in other words. And uh, he also promised, you know, in the context of chapter 10, verse 16, when he says, Be beware of men, you know, devil you up to the councils, they will scourge you in their synagogues, and he shall be brought before governors and kings and so on. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. It's fantastic when you think about what the Lord says. He says, I am not going to make it too easy for them. Don't worry about it. Beware of man. And I'm going, to, I'm going to make you strong. I'm going to give you defense when you are being interrogated by authorities or when you get in the crosshair of somebody that's really against you and you're standing for the right thing. And he says, you know what? I'm going to be with you. I'm going to deliver you by even your own speech. You know, I always think about Apostle Paul, how smart it was when he was uh, <clears throat> in trouble. But then he says, then he kind of like a, you know, light went on. And he says, you know what? I am here interrogated or persecuted for my persuasion about resurrection. Knowing very well that that's going to destroy it's make, it's make them start fighting because Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. Pharisees did. So they started fighting with each other. And you know what happened? They said, well, you know what? Let's just let him go. It's a brilliant. See, Jesus doesn't want us to just, just go and just, just let the enemy just kill us. You know, like some people think. Yeah, we are sheep um, giving to the wolves. No. Yeah, that's what you are. So be harmless as doves. But you know what? Get some smarts. Be a little bit smart about this. And don't let the enemy to just destroy you. All right? And uh, so uh, the principle number five would be add wisdom to your zeal and passion. It's good to be passionate. It's good to be ambitious that you're going to change the world. But get some wisdom and pick your bottle. Now, um, we can learn from uh, the battle of, against Benjamin in Judges uh, chapter 20. You know, when they came, and first time, and they came to the battle, what was their first attitude? I'm sure there was a passion and zeal. When they saw what happened, they were so mad, and they wanted to fix it, right? So what did they have? Passion and zeal, right? Um, but they got, uh, was it easy to establish order? No. It's not easy to establish order, especially when they didn't ask God. We'll get to that in a second. Second question, when they failed and they came to God, it was a different question, and they asked for confirmation. Is this something we should do? And God says, yeah, this is something you should do. But it was the third time when they added to the, question, to the, to the matter of zeal and passion, you can say that they added their inquiry of wisdom. And they asked God, what should we do? Right? What should we do? How should we do it? What should we do? 
See, before they didn't have that. They just had, uh, let's just do it. But that's not enough. It's not enough to know what is the right order of things. You know, and then just stand bold and I'm going to be a strong man. You're going to be, you can be slaughtered. Sometimes maybe it's good. Okay, we know there's a problem. How are we going to do this? How are we going to really approach the problem? How are we going to um, attack the enemy? <clears throat> Next principle, acknowledge God. Acknowledge God. And that's kind of what we see also in that story of uh, battle against Benjamin. So it's safe to assume that you're not going to win every battle. Uh, first of all, it's not possible to just fix the whole world, right? So you're going to have to pick and choose. And also maybe uh, pick and choose your battlefield. Um, now, maybe you will win every battle in your life. Maybe like David. David asked for the will of God. And he, David is known to win every battle. David, David never lost a battle. It's amazing. Uh, track record. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, we know that scripture. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct the paths. The Bible clearly teaches us, it's good that you know, and you strive for righteousness, you know what is justice, you know what needs to be done, you know where the problems are, and maybe you are in a position to do something about it, but don't just rush into fixing it. Add wisdom, we talked about that. And ask God. Acknowledge Him. Ask God. <clears throat> I already mentioned David. You see often David, when he sees enemy, when he deals with some situation, he says, should I or should I not? What should I do? He's constantly asking God what he should do. Then God tells him, yeah, you can overcome them. Yeah, you can go to the battle. I'll deliver him to your hand. And then he goes and wins. So this is happening, uh, and this is something that we ought to really employ in, uh, in our struggle against uh, rebellion in this world. You know, including government going rogue. Don't just, don't just be, you know, it's, it's very impressive. I'm just going to stand there. I'm not going to let them steal my rights. Well, just remember what is your, there's kind of another thing, you know, what, how much you're willing to lose. And how much are you willing to give up? I don't have it in my notes, but uh, here's another thing that often fighting for something oh, is going to cost you something. All right? Fighting is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you some kind of blood. All right? And so you've got to decide, is this worth uh, the price? You know, sometimes people stand... Uh, you have people that will stand against the tax. You know, some people argue that taxation is, is illegal. You know, and I, I maybe, you know, maybe it is illegal, you know. There, there's a lot of illegal things that are happening and we accept them as normal. All right. Well, what if somebody picks that as a fight, fight of their life? Well, then the government is going to throw you into prison. I mean, first of all, what have you accomplished? And uh, are you willing to pay the price? I personally am not willing to die, to go to prison for taxes. <laughs> not, not at all. I'd rather pay the taxes, to be honest with you. And focus on, on a fight that matters. Because this, in the end, remember, it's not about his world. This world might as well be taxed. It's funny how God, speaking of taxes, notice how God is using things that are not right in this world. And God is using for his purpose. It was not, it was not the taxation that God used to bring Jesus to Bethlehem and be born there. You know, God doesn't, it's a, it seems like a, it's not a problem for God. So it's not a problem for me. <clears throat> Here's an example where uh, people pray and seek God's leadership. When in a situation when somebody was out of their bound and out of their limits. Uh, and that's the story of Esther. You know, when uh, Haman make uh, this proclamation, uh, pass this law, that the Jews are going to be all slaughtered. Then what did they do? The Bible says in Esther chapter 4, Then Esther bade them to return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So much to learn here. She was willing to pay price. 
And also she went to God to ask for leadership. Please, please do something. We are, can't do it. I can't do it. Now, could she just, could she just, you know what, this is outrageous. And just, you know, you know, we're going to stand against it. Right? She could do that. Would it work? I'm not sure, you know. Could she just go straight to the husband? Hey, I have an influence now. Let's just, let's just uh, leverage the influence. Did she just do that? No, she was careful about it. She did not make the mistakes that the Israel made when they were fighting Benjamin. It took them two lost battles before they finally asked the better question. She has it right from the beginning. She realized it's a really precarious situation. And she came to the uh, to, to Lord to ask, ask, ask. And you know how it turned out? The night before the party, the banquet, the night before the banquet, he couldn't sleep. He went to the Chronicles and he found a story about Mordecai. Who did it? Who did it? God did it. Another story, of course, we have Hezekiah. There's plenty of stories. You, 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 can, you could probably help me. I'm thinking of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was uh, occupied by uh, Assyrian uh, king, uh, Assyrian general. And uh, what does he do? You know, he goes to the temple, he lays it down before God, and he says, Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the living God. Again, and, and it turned out to be a victorious day. No, no shot, no battle, no lost life. Just, just completely over. And there's so many others. So clearly the Bible teaches us, in all thy ways acknowledge him. Even when you stand for the right thing, it's not enough to know that you are standing for the right thing. Engage God and apply, uh, apply wisdom. And my final point, pick your battles and pick your battlefields carefully. So again, are you willing to die for every cause? You know, we were discussing uh, different issues. Uh, I was already mentioning taxes. Uh, you have a house search. You know, social, social, social services, you know, child, child services, whatever. They somehow has the power, have the power to just show up and enter your house. I think that's illegal. You know, it's wrong. You know, we were talking about man that, that just fights for his liberty to drive without driving license. You know, people already are so used to having driving license that we don't even think about it much. But we don't need driving license. There's people, they, 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 they fight for their liberty to drive without driving license. The question is, you know, is it really the battle that I want to pick? If I want to go to prison for not, maybe I'll win. But maybe there will be some uh, out of control policeman will shoot me. You know, because I'm, gonna, I'm not going to allow him to, my, to get to my car or something like that, right? I may get shot. Is it something that I really want to, you know, do I really want to stand for it? Maybe. You know, I'm not saying no. But you really have to think. And ask the Lord, what battle is your battle? Is every battle your battle? We're talking about masks wearing, right? You know, that's, uh, you know, first of all, apply some wisdom and think about, you know, how far you want to take it. Maybe, maybe it's, it's time to stand, and, uh, but just think about it, all right? Um, here's, a, I, I, here's my final few thoughts. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> it's interesting. The Bible gives us so many different ways how people got their way without causing too much turbulence. Sometimes it was turbulence and sometimes it wasn't. So a few examples in closing. Sometimes just a humble request does a lot as opposed to just stand for your right. Right? I have an example from Daniel. Uh, the servants of, uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, children of Israel, when they ended up in Babylonian captivity and ended up uh, being groomed for some kind of royal service. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 12, how these young men came to their master there and they asked him for a special diet. And they say, prove thy servants, we besiege thee. I besiege thee, he says, 10 days. Give us a chance. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So you can see the humility of it and sort of trying to 
work with the person, right? As opposed to having this attitude, we're not going to, we're going to, right? They, but, the, you know, the very same people, when they are confronted uh, with the situation that they're supposed to bow down to an idol, then they take a strong step. You know, they're not asking, would you be okay if we don't bow? You know, they, we would consider that to be weak, and they didn't do it. So the same people applied uh, definitely different, different uh, uh, caliber uh, for a different situation. Sometimes it was right to just go and be gentle about it and put a request on, and that actually got them somewhere. Another time they took a bold statement, and that also got them somewhere. Another example, um, I have an example which I would call excuse. You know, instead of, uh, instead of just pushing your way, or, uh, you know, how to protect your way, again, if you, let's say, do something that God asks you to do, Imagine this, some kind of example, okay? God is asking you to do something, and you know if you do that, you're going to be in a crosshair of the government. So now what? All right? Well, maybe, maybe you can learn from uh, Samuel. So God asks Samuel to go and anoint David to be the king. And Samuel says, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. So here's the dilemma, right? The government is against you, but God is telling you another thing. How do I do this? Now, this is interesting. This is not from Samuel's head. This is what the Lord advised Samuel. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. It's pretty neat, eh? And this is from God. Giving you an excuse. We know why you're going there. We know what's the purpose of this trip. Is to anoint an enemy to Saul, uh, to his replacement, his, his uh, you know, competition. He's not going to like it. But let's just do it under the cloak of, uh, of uh, sacrifice. And they, I'm sure they sacrificed, you know, but that was not the main purpose. <clears throat> so apply it. You know, you know the, the sky is the limit. I mean, what you can do with this? And uh, call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him who I may name after, uh, uh, unto thee. Now, another, another way to deal... So, see, he got his way. He obeyed God, and he didn't get any trouble with the government. Now, let's learn from this. I'd say this is a wise discernment. All right? This is some wisdom. Another one is uh, sometimes just... Just ignore the king's commandments. You don't have to necessarily stand there against the king as just, you know, in defiance. I am not moving an inch. Instead, you see uh, the midwives. You know, midwives were commanded by the king, by Pharaoh. He told them, the king of Egypt, this is in Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shiphrah, and the name of the other Pua. And uh, a little bit insignificant people, actually, but they got their name into the Bible. Why? Because for their stand, right? And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. So the clear commandment was this. You deliver baby, but kill the baby if it's a boy. But the midwives fear God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men and children alive. Right? They just ignored the commandment. And then, of course, we know actually the king asked them, what's going on? How come this is happening? And they came up with this excuse. They basically lied. They lied, right? And they said, well, you know, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. When they have a baby, it just comes out and we come, it's too late. And you know it's not true. But uh, you know what? God blessed them. God blessed them. They were not in some kind of open defiance. Why? Well, because just two midwives against Pharaoh, an army. Yeah? What do you do? So they kind of, you know, they kind of... They, have, you heard, have you heard people sometimes say, well, I didn't see it, right? That's what they did. I, okay, just don't, just don't tell anybody. That's what they were doing. And listen, I am not necessarily here promoting some kind of rebellion against our authorities. But if the authority is out of line, if they are rebelling against higher authority, 
then let's seek way how to get proper authority on our life. And sometimes it may be open defiance, like the young man in the fiery furnace, and sometimes it may be some little subtle way. A little bit wise, wise a serpent, all right? A little bit uh, smart about it. And also seeking God's, uh, God's leadership. And then, uh, listen, this may be a little bit... Uh, uh, disappointing, but you know what? Sometimes there is time to accept the fate. Sometimes just just accept it. Sometimes just just what we hear. After all, the Bible tells us that we ought to be um, we ought to have our conversation and communication without covetousness, and be happy with the things that we have. And uh, the bottom line, we're not going to get all our we're not going to get this world to be a perfect kingdom, all right? And we're going to have to accept certain things that uh, we don't like. An example would be, again, from Esther. When Esther pleads with, uh, um, when she finally opens her case uh, to the king, um, she says this, then Esther, the queen, answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition, and my people at my request, for we are sold, I and my people to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. So notice she is pleading, duh. If she doesn't, they are probably going to get killed. So there's nothing left. Let's give it a shot. And she says, if I perish, I perish. Right? So she pleads with the king. But notice what she says. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue. So think about it. So it's not pleasant to live in this place. <clears throat> they don't have the life they used to have in Israel. It's not fun to live there. By the rivers of Babylon, when we, you know, it's a weeping. It's a sad time. I wish we could go back. But this is what we have. <clears throat> Are we born men and born women? Do we have junk in this world? Is everything perfect? Of course it is not. But she said, I would have had held my tongue. <clears throat> Although the enemy could not contravail <clears throat> the king's damage. So I would say that sometimes, again, pick your battle. Sometimes, sometimes I'd go with the junk. I'd go with the junk. You do too. You may not even think about it, but you're already accepting a lot of junk. I mentioned driving license. I mentioned a lot of things that we are sort of controlled by somebody, and it's not necessary. But we, you know, what do you want to do? So we, we, we do live with it. We accept some of it. But you know what? If we can get by with liberty, let's go for it. If we can promote liberty, let's go for it. So that would be my principle number seven. Pick your battle. So in summary, we're done. Um, remember, the Bible teaches us that we ought to be, it's good to be zealous. It's good to know what the proper authorities are. It's good to understand where the rebellion is happening. And if I can somehow influence things in a positive way, then please do it. Let's all do it. But let's also remember that, first of all, this is not uh, our future. This is not our kingdom. We are only visitors. We're passing. This is not our future. Second, let's remember that you're not going to get always your way. And uh, uh, you're gonna, you may have to accept uh, some, of the, some of the junk, be, tons of it, because li we are living where we are living. You know, Alberta, you know, just an example. There's these people talking about um, separation from Canada, right? It's nonsense. I mean, just my opinion. Uh, like, and, and then what? You know, are we going to have our military? You, you cannot defend Alberta against Canada. So maybe maybe U.S. would have to somehow uh, take us in, but then you are under a different junk. You know, it's just that this nonsense to be some kind of independent Alberta. And, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's the people think that we, we're going to get out. If we don't get this way, we're going to get our, this other way. And we will be then free. Yeah, right. Uh, people will fail you. People will fail you. That's another principle. So don't trust people. 
Uh, remember that God will never let you down. Remember to add zeal to zeal and passion, wisdom. Learn to pray and seek uh, God for leadership. And in final, pick your battles and pick your battlefields. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Amen? All right, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, what a uh, comfort to know that you are uh, with us, you are our God, and uh, that you care about our well-being in this world. But at the same time, you allow us to be in the world that's mad. Uh, we may be persecuted in this world. We may not have liberties that we could potentially have if we live in some kind of perfect world. Uh, but Lord, uh, your answer to all these issues is that you are building a completely different kingdom. And so teach us, Lord, and help us to be reminded of uh, the fact that our hope is not for this world. Unlike a lot of people that we may sympathize with because they stand for conservative values and so on, unlike them, Lord, we have a hope which they miss. And so let us never forget uh, what we are living for, what is the purpose in this world, and what it is not, and help us to be a light to this world by, uh, first of all, um, loving uh, you, loving the world, loving the people, and by uh, uh, bringing the gospel and the light and the hope uh, of the eternal kingdom uh, to the to the people that are desperate and uh, destitute and uh, and uh, empty and uh, um, in a dark place. Help us, Lord, with that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.